What is going on guys? Happy Wednesday. Hopefully everyone's doing excellent today as always. Um, I've had a few questions lately about some of the common kind of reef pests and two of the ones that came up a little more so often were Aptasia and Nudibranch. So I figured it'd be a kind of a good topic today to go over and discuss some of the common ways to deal with them or get rid of them. And yeah, hopefully, you know, if any of you guys have any questions along the way, as always, just feel free to ask and let me know. Um, so one of the most common ones that probably everyone's had at some point is Aptasia. Now, Aptasia are glass anemones, another thing I've heard them called, or Mahanos. Um, but essentially, they are like an anemone. They're see-through. They're not, you know, they're super duper hardy. They're probably almost hard to kill. But these guys can become a pest because they'll start taking over in your tank. So they can spread all over the place, and usually that's one of the main reasons they're called a pest. Um, they can also sneak in on corals, frag plugs. That's usually how most people get them. What's going on, Reefer Raycan? Brian Rista, what's going on? What's going on, Philip? Tina, welcome, welcome. So the most common one I'm sure almost all of you guys have had is Aptasia. Um, if you buy use Chato off somebody, it's one easy way it could come in. What's going on, Reef Keeper, Casey? Um, so yeah, Aptasia. So Casey Reef, I use these slugs so worth the money. So definitely one good natural way of get dealing with them. <laughs> Aptasia and Astrina stars are the worst. Astrina stars, they're fairly harmless though. I mean, 90% of them are. Um, actually, I have Monty needing new ranks currently. There you go. I've dealt with those a few months back, so we'll definitely get to that one in a few. Um, okay, so first one is, you know, as with anything, you just want to avoid getting these pests in your tank in the first place. Um, with Aptasia, most of the time, you know, if you buy used live rock, you're going to get it. What's going on, Gabes? This one's for you, buddy. <laughs> um, so actually, today's stream was special request by Gabe. So it should be good. Um, another common way I've seen Aptasia show up in a tank is coming in on Chato. What's going on, homegrown frags? So if you get some used Chato off somebody, they have a bunch in your tank. Very easy way to get in your tank. Um, even frag plugs. A lot of time you'll see it at the base of it. Um, another one I've seen is having it on Zoas. Like sometimes they'll be right in the middle of a little colony of Zoas. Um, so there's a few commercial products that can do it. I did link a few in the description. Um, Aptasia X by Red Sea is a fairly common one. Now, one thing with that is it does kill it, but I find sometimes if you don't get it all, I don't know if it grows back from flesh or if there's babies or releases something. So that is one tricky way. Um, yeah, DC say natural predators are the best way. I do agree. And we'll get to those ones in one sec. What's going on? Aaron's Aquarium. DC, two please reef. Go, go. What's going on, guys? So um, there is stuff. Uh, Joe's Juice is another fairly common one. I've seen lots, lots of good reviews on that one. It's kind of like a juicy squirt on it. Um, one stuff you might already have in your refrigerator, you can use something like lemon juice. So you get a little syringe and inject it with lemon juice, and that's one thing that will take it out and kill it. Um, I've also seen people use kelp paste. So there is a lot of, you know, commercial solutions. Um, another kind of fun way, I've never tried it, but you can get high-powered lasers. So I watched a video a while ago from Mark from Mila's Reef, and, you know, he has this blue laser in there just zapping him away. So that is one way to do it. Um, however, the only issue I find with some of those, as fun as it would be to hunt them down and kill them with a laser, is if you don't get it all, that they can potentially come back. So that's just one thing to kind of take into consideration. Now, on the natural side of things, which is generally what I prefer to do, um, so McKellen's Reef threw one of the good ones out there, so peppermint shrimps. So peppermint shrimps are all around pretty awesome. That's personally what I've used in the past. I mean, they're fairly cheap to get. The, they will hunt down Aptasia. Now, if you don't see them doing it, don't really worry about it because they're more of a nocturnal kind of shrimp. They're going to hide in the day and come out and start munching down at nighttime. So keep that in mind. Um, another common issue I see is there's another type of peppermint shrimp that's similar. It's called a camel or a false peppermint shrimp. And the difference is if you look at them physically, there's a bit of a hump on their back. And those ones will not eat peppermint shrimp, but they're questionable even if they're reef safe. So those are ones you definitely want to avoid. Now on the fish side, you got something like uh, there is Aptasia eating foul fish. Um, they're the ones that I've seen are only about three inches big. So you could have them, you know, a smallish tank, which is kind of nice. 
Um, they are prone to possibly nip at coral, so LPS. I mean, hit or miss, I had a buddy that had one issue free, but I've also heard of other ones that will nip at corals. One production, don't forget that thumbs up. Appreciate it. If you guys enjoy it, as always, smash that like button. Always appreciate it. Um, yeah, so Casey, okay, camels aren't reef safe. So yeah, camels are trouble. Um, but they're sometimes sold as peppermint shrimp because sometimes people don't know any better because they look very, very similar. Um, yeah, I forgot the Mahano wand. So Mahano wand was an interesting device. It basically used electricity and it would put it through a needle. So you'd use a low voltage power and it would essentially go through a piece of graphite. I made one one time, so I know. Um, and so it used the graphite and it'd go through the needle and it'd put a current through it. And doing this created, I think it was hydrogen peroxide created. It basically helped dissolve it. Um, but same thing with some of the other ways. If you don't fully get it, then some of it will come back again. So it's questionable if it fully kills it. I built one for fun. I was still on the fence. If it was a big thing, it killed that one, but I don't think it fully eradicated them. That's why I still tend to go through natural predators. Um, if you have giant ones, then like Aptasia X or Joe's Juice or one of these other methods is definitely a good solution. But for the babies, I like natural. Um, another fish is the copper band butterfly shrimp. They love to eat Aptasia. Now the downfall with them is they can be very picky eaters. So usually people have a bit of a challenge to get them eating. Um, one, if you guys do have a copper band, uh, manila clams, I believe it is. One my buddy had really good success with eating those. Um, so you need to make sure that whatever you get to eat it is they have a variety of diet and not just that because then you'll have issues. You got to rehome it or figure out something to help them out later. Um, there's also a nudibranch that will eat them called, I think it's Bergia is the name. Now, the Bergias will eat them, and ideally need a few of them. Now, the only downfall is I think they can be a little bit more expensive, you know, 15 and 20 bucks for these little guy, and ideally you want a bunch of them. Now, if you have certain fish in your tank that eat pests, they might also eat them, and there goes your Aptasia squad. So it's kind of a double-edged sword on that one. Calypso Reef and Ravenclaw, Lazy Reefer, Max B. What's going on, guys? <laughs> I have a fish only with live rock. I'll grad graduate to reef soon. Excellent. Start with the easy coral, man. Just take your fish only live rock. You know, you get some leather corals, some like hammers, LPS. Just put in some easy ones and just start slowly working with your tank. You'll love it. Homegrown frags. You beat the Bergia. Very nice. Very nice. It, it makes me laugh when um, I've seen, you know, so you grow some, and sometimes I see posts of people that grow them, they're like, yep, yeah, looking for Aptasia, anyone got some on a rock, and you know, I'm trying to feed them, because you need to give them a constant source of food to keep them breeding. So it's kind of funny when they're like, yes, I need more Aptasia. So kind of a few different ones. So biggest way to avoid Aptasia in the first place is to really inspect everything you add to the tank. If, you know, if you see it on a frag plug, break break the core off the plug, or you know, raise a razor blade and cut it off. But that's one of the biggest one. <laughs> it's no septage on the right. Excellent. Okay, so there's basically aptasia in a nutshell. If you haven't had it in your tank, there's a good chance it'll end up there, and eventually, it's just one of those evils of the hobby. So another really fun, not so fun one. Many years ago, I had zoa eating nudibranchs. So these guys are generally about. Uh, they're fairly small. I'm going to say like a grain of rice, maybe a bit bigger. Um, they're probably a little bit bigger than that. Like 8 millish rent, somewhere around there. And these are these little punks will eat your zoas. So there's certain ones, these little pests, where they only have a taste for something specific. And they're generally like a tan kind of color. But the thing that makes them sneaky is if they eat your zoas, I don't know if they, I think they absorb some of that zoos and theli, and they'll take on the color what they're eating. So he could be hiding in the middle of a colony of zoas and he'll blend right in because those all his little thingies on the back of them are going to be the same colors as zoa, so you won't even notice. Um, so nudibranchs are actually sea slugs. There's lots of awesome, really cool looking ones, and there's some of the troublemakers. So the main two troublemakers we're going to talk about today are the zoe eating ones and the Montipore eating ones because those are the most common. Two, please! 19 out of 79, smash those thumbs up! Do please thank you for the Della 99 super chat and if you guys enjoying this smash that thumbs up button i appreciate it and i think youtube gods do as well so uh, much much appreciated thank you too please so the zoa ones generally a um, couple ways to get rid of them and this is kind of going to go for most monty 
or Zoe eating nudibranchs is that they are you can get rid of the adult so if you dip it they are fairly resilient so you might need a bit of a stronger multiple dips to do it um, so you can get them off with a dip however they generally lay eggs and the dips have zero effect on the eggs so that's usually what gets you so you could really inspect the coral everything looks fine and there could be eggs on there and that could be how it gets into your system so the real way to prevent them from getting your tank would be quarantine all your corals however most people don't do that um, they'll dip it few people actually have a full coral quarantine tank so that's one of the biggest things uh tasia for me is impossible to avoid i just have to control them that's fair enough uh qt sucks when i hear cool new things like bumblebee snails eating vermid snails i do have a single bumblebee snail and i do not have any vermid snails so that i can't say i've ever seen it happen but that may be why breed up <laughs> i have a copper band i think i would breed up tasia in the sum to have a constant supply well there you go it's definitely an option I, personally, I would rather just get them eating other foods, but each their own. <laughs> uh, I'd rather deal with Aptasia over vermid snails. Yeah, bumblebees must work, because I honestly have no vermid snails in my tank, and I have had little bumblebees because I thought they looked cool when I originally got them. Okay, so Zoe eating nudibranchs. Okay, so nudibranchs, they are basically a sea slug. Lots of really cool, amazing looking ones, but the few we don't like. So one kind of fun thing is that a little hair, little tentacles on the back are actually kind of like their gills. It's how they breathe a lot of them, which is kind of neat. Um, generally, they're kind of white with bits of frilly bits on them. Um, these guys are around eight millimeters, roughly in size for an adult. Uh, one, so usually they do blend in really well because they'll turn into whatever color they're eating. So that's what I see. Now, one of the easiest ways, if you see a bunch of zoas that aren't opening up or your colony is starting to like fade and melt, check your tank at night. Because when your zoas are all closed up at night, that's when their little color frills will stand out. So if you have, you know, like either a normal flashlight or the blue flashlights, they'll help pop more at night. So it's a good way to kind of spot them and figure out if they are in your tank. Now, you can take that coral out and you could dip it. Um, now, if you are dipping it, either... Coral Rx works pretty well, pretty well for most of these guys. It is a little harsher on the corals. Zoas are pretty hardy, so you're pretty safe there. Um, the other big thing is you really want to agitate it. So use like a turkey baster or use a syringe and just keep blasting it with water because you want to dislodge them and get them off of the colony. So this works out well if you can take the coral out of the tank. If the coral is in the tank, then you might have to try and physically remove them. So the adults i find you could either you know if you had tweezers you can kind of poke them out um if you're doing a water change you can suck them out now this is going to work for the adults now it's going to take time to get them all because if there's eggs um i believe the life cycle is about i think it was four or five days for the these guys for them to hatch so or maybe it's 48 days but basically every four or so days you'd have to re-dip that coral until you eventually get them now again as with Instead of using commercial products, a uh, freshwater dip is one thing you can do. Something that's free. You could use your RODI and give your corals a dip in that. A lot of pests don't like that. Zoas can handle the freshwater dip. Um, generally, they're pretty hardy. Mileage may vary. Usually a shorter freshwater dip and then just agitate it and stuff it off. Um, the other one I like to do with Zoas is use iodine. Because Zoas like iodine. And iodine is good for getting rid of a lot of different pests. That's another kind of one to consider that has some good potential. Um, now, another good one that I find works really well is have wrasses in your tank. So wrasses are awesome little pest control. They will go after the babies, which is a big thing. So the biggest thing that you got to do is get rid of the babies before they get to adulthood and lay new eggs. So you got to break that life cycle so they don't keep coming back. Uh, what's the longest anyone's kept electric flame scale up? I probably had one for about six or seven months maybe longer um you do got to feed their filter feeders so i mean i think feeding phyto or small particulate foods would be kind of key for those guys for long term i need someone to upload a video of a bumblebee snail eating vermid snails i don't have any vermid snails for him to eat though he needs something though he survives i've had that guy for years Uh, is Magna and Aquashella Chicago on the list this year? Um, 
Magna is. I am planning to go there. And actually, I'm going to keep on reefing this weekend. So if anybody is in Connecticut type area, better come out and say hi. Because that should be fun. I actually am flying out tomorrow morning super duper early. So be a good journey. Uh, Matt, gotta go buy, <laughs> gotta go work to buy more fish. See you later, Max. Thanks for hanging out. Okay, now, so Aptasia talked about uh, Zoe eating ones we kind of went over. Now, one of the bigger buggers of the hobby is dealing with Montipora eating nudibranchs. So these guys are a little trickier to get rid of. So that photo there was actually one that I took because I caught one of the little punks. And this was a while back, but in uh, my Nano, I'm like, I had a chunk of my Rainbow Monty, and you know, it's, it was getting white, and it slowly looks like it was dying off and getting whiter. I was like, what the heck? And I dip absolutely everything in my tank. So I'm like OCD about dipping. Nothing goes in the tank unless I dip it. And I'm starting to see this what I thought was die off. So I kept being like, what the heck is it? I actually discovered it was these Monty Pora eating nudibranchs or eating my Rainbow Monty. So that was a bugger. And now, of course, it's encrusted by rocks. So there's no way to take it out. There's no way to dip it. Um, so in the daytime, you don't see it. Most of the time, they'll hide. And they'll generally hide on either the underside of the coral, or if you have sponge growth, like they'll hide around the edges or the very base of it. Um, this week, first of all. Uh, so Victor's asking, I have a couple zoophrags and one is not opening for a week and the rest are fine. Um, it could just be that one zoo is not happy if it's a brand new one, but it never hurts to just give it a really good inspection. Um, iodine dip is never really hurts either for zoas, but I would just keep an eye on it. Uh, are you going to wrap New York? Nope. I'm cut off after keep on reefing and then probably take a break until Macna. I'm tripped out for a while here. It's not cheap going on all these trips. Adds up. Um, so yeah, so keep on reefing. So if you guys, anyone's in Connecticut area, come say hi. Because I will be there tomorrow night. Okay, uh, so these little guys, little punks in. They're in there. They're attacking my Monty. It's slowly getting whiter. I'm like freaking out. What the heck's going on? There's no way I can take it out. My rock is literally all glued together. And it's just encrusting. It's crazy. It's everywhere. So... Um, First thing I did, once I actually figured out what it was, how I discovered it is inspecting the tank with a flashlight. And you don't see them when the lights are on, but when the lights are out. So first thing in the morning, go check your tank with a flashlight and, you know, just really inspect it around the edges. I ended up seeing, you know, that little wood, a bit of white stuff moving. Now the actual size is probably like a grain of rice or smaller, so they're pretty tiny. Um, so what I did to actually get rid of these guys was, first of all, was manual removal. So for about three or four days straight. I took my water change hose and I would just suck out, you know, a gallon of water, whatever it took. And I'd remove as many as I physically could from the tank. And so I did that for a few days. So I know I could, you know, take out most of the adults. However, I also know that there's likely babies that are going to come. Um, so for that case, I added a yellow chorus wrasse. So those guys, you can get them pretty tiny and they're awesome pest hunters. They're, they're probably one of the best. Um, I think a few minutes ago, somebody asked if all wrasses will eat. Uh, most will. However, when they're small, they are better getting in the cracks and stuff. If they get too big, they might not be the best little hunter. Um, Victor, I'll see you at core. Heck yes. McCullum's Reef's going to be there too. I'll rat a rat. Should be good. Uh, mostly Reef's dipping every three days did more damage to the Monty than, than the eating nudies. Yeah, so... If you're using too strong of a dip, it is harsh on the coral. So it's definitely something you gotta consider. So natural ways are always gonna be your best bet, especially if you can get someone to help you hunt them down. I don't know if, um, what are they called? There's a form of damsel fish, I believe, that will also pick at them. I know they'll eat flatworms and stuff. It is, we'll go back to once I remember what they're called. But they're good little, good little hunters. There's also certain types of like pipe fish. I don't know if they'll go after these, but they'll go after red bugs and other ones. So having a good army of pest hunters in your tank is also key too. If you have a big established tank, you may not have an easy way of getting them all. So having a little army to kind of keep in line or take care of it for you can go a long ways into making sure that your tank doesn't get, you know, overrun. And it doesn't become a huge issue. So suck them all out three or four days. Didn't see any more adults after that. Um, I added a small yellow chorus wrasse, and he was in the tank. Springer Daniel, thank you very much. That's the one. 
Uh, yeah, so Springer or Black Dot down. So, so those guys are pretty good for pest hunting uh, as all, well, or any of the small races. Uh, Yellow Course is probably, you know, one of the go-to war courses. <laughs> About three or four people Springer. YouTube delay. Um, yeah, so definitely awesome. So something to consider. Um, I do hear they can be a bit of a punks though. Like sometimes they'll nip at you. <laughs> so mileage may vary depending on uh, Leopard Ras works great for them. Excellent. What's going on, Greg? Welcome, welcome. Um, so yeah, mountain removal. Yellow Quartz Ras for me is basically how I got rid of the Mont eating ones that I had in my now for a while. I uh, left the yellow or the yellow chorus rass. He's pretty small. I left him in the tank for about a month, and then I moved into my bigger tank after that. So he was in there long enough to break the life cycle of any of the babies. So you could, you know, dip it every five days, or you just put a little hunter in there to take care of them and pick them up for you. So a couple different ways of doing it. Now, someone, a couple of people were talking about the vermid snails earlier. Um, Bumblebee snails are definitely one of the ones I'll know when to eat them. Uh, I've also seen people just break off the little tubes or you can super glue their tubes shut. So now kind of sealing it in essentially. So that does kind of work for Aptasia too. Just sort of throwing that one out there. I have seen it fits in a little hole. I mean, you could glue over it or post, put some epoxy over or something in there just to make sure that it doesn't escape. So kind of a couple different ways. If you were super hardcore, I mean, you'd quarantine every single coral for, you know, for a month or a couple months. <laughs> and um yeah so one way to do it. good to hear Devin speaking since you didn't speak much last week <laughs> nice what's going on lkky plays easy reefing mostly reefs reef caper greg carroll uh leopard wrasse is also great fish i do have one in my big tank they're really cool little guys and if you guys have any other questions about any other kind of common pass let me know too uh do all wrasses eat monty nudies i don't know um, most wrasses will hunt little creatures, especially the smaller ones, because they get in little nooks and crannies. Um, I don't know if they all will, but I do think most wrasses in general are pretty good pest hunters. So overall, it's, they're just great to have them. Now, if you do have wrasses, again, you need to have a lid on your tank because they're a notorious jumper, so something to keep in mind. Um, when wrasses get bigger, sometimes they can be a bit of punks, like they may flip over corals trying to get to little pests and stuff underneath it. So if you get wrasses that go too big, like I know one of my buddies had a red chorus wrasse, and that thing was constantly flipping over stuff on the sand bed, and it just got massive. It was a very beautiful fish, but same thing. Get rid of it. Uh, first time able to watch it live. All right, Claudia. Excellent. Good to have you here. Yeah, so not not all wrasses will. Lots do. Uh, six line is a great one. Six line is probably one of the most popular kind of pest hunters in the hobby. Those guys have the nice colorful lines. It seems to be a bit of a love-hate relationship. Some people love them. Some say they're buggers. So it's something you got to consider too. Um, the personality of every creature is going to be different, right? So some fish could be model citizens. Others could be punks. Um, the other thing you're going to consider too is like when we're talking about Aptasia eaters. So we have, there's a file fish that eats it. There's also copper brown butterfly, a couple different butterflies. But some of those will also potentially nip at corals. Um, generally, if it's like LPS or softies, like ACANs. Like I know my buddy had his copper band was nipping at some of the ACANs. So actually, a few of my ACANs came from him because they're just getting destroyed by his copper band. So it's one thing to kind of consider, right? Um, yep. So peppermint shrimp eat Aptasia, definitely do. Uh, I did say this one earlier, but just to kind of rehash it, make sure it's a true peppermint shrimp and not a false peppermint shrimp, also called a camelback. Um, those guys will not eat Aptasia, and they're questionably not reef safe. So, just gotta make sure you just get the proper, legit ones. Um, pyramid snails. I've never really had an issue with pyramid snails. So I can't say I've ever had to deal with that one, so I'm not 100% sure on that one. Do wrasses jack up your sand bed at all? So, there is a chunk of wrasses that will sleep inside of your sand bed. So some will sleep in the rocks, like fairy wrasses and some of the more, those type of guys, like flasher wrasses. A lot of them will sleep in rocks. Uh, leopard wrasses, chorus wrasses, a bunch of those guys will sleep in millinaires, I believe does too. They'll sleep in the sand bed. So in general, it's not a big issue. They might do little dust storms here and there. Like every once in a while, look at the tank, I'll see a big cloud storm as one of them just dive bombs into the sand bed. It's like, whoosh, a little smoke of sand. But 
overall are pretty good. Uh, this one thing I see a lot of people do, bare bottom tanks. So if you have a bare bottom tank, something to keep in mind is I've one thing you can do is have like a container, like a Tupperware container, something of sand in there, but give a home for your ass to sleep in if you are using it for pest control and you are doing the bare bottom route. So another consideration. Lismata Wonder Money Pemperlant Shrimp. I have to Google that. Is that the scientific name I'm assuming? Yes. Uh, are there any shrimp that will be predatory to the Monty eating nudibranchs? Not that I know of. Um, coral banded shrimp will go after some pests. I've never personally owned one, so I can't say for sure if they would or they wouldn't. Um, yeah, so Greg was saying Bergia seemed to be the best solution. Bergia are the best solution if you don't have wrasses. If you do have wrasses, then Bergia are just expensive snacks. Because how we're saying that wrasses are great to deal with um, the Montipora eating or the Zoe eating ones, they would also go after the Bergia, which would be your Aptasia eating ones. So it's kind of a double edged sword on which one. So it kind of depends what fish you have in the tank. Bergias are super popular though. And if you can get a few of those guys in the tank and they breed and thrive, they'll clear out your Aptasia over time. So definitely a good solution. As long as you don't have fish that are going to eat them. Otherwise, there goes your, your Aptasia fighting crew. Ozzy just added today a nudie brand. I have three. Nice. Excellent, Ozzy. Let us know how it works. Should be good. A lot of people seem to love them. Um, I've looked at them before, but I never had Aptasia to worry about. When I did have it, um, peppermint shrimp cleared up for me. I had two peppermint shrimp in the tank, and they just disappeared. And this was a year ago, and I haven't had one since, so I guess I've locked out on that side. <laughs> Some larger varieties will even jack up your rock work. Cigar wrasses, larger chorus wrasses. Most of the time, it's isolated to just sand us sleeping. Yeah, I have my Melanaris wrasse right now. Super cool, beautiful fish. But every once in a while, he'll just flip over a coral. I'm like, you bugger. So I got to go back in there and flip it back over so it doesn't die from being buried in the sand. So you got to keep it on it once your wrasses get larger. Or make sure your frags aren't they're glued to a rock and not just chilling in the sand bed the whole time. Uh, <laughs> correct there, lunch for sand beds. Yeah, so if you have a ras and Bergia snails, those are expensive snacks. Uh, easy Reef and Melanaris rafts are good, but when they get bigger, they take out snails to eat small crabs. 100%. That is my current issue, actually. I've been debating selling or trading in my Melanaris rafts because any small snails, like you can see on the back, the back wall where I have actually where the little damsels right now, my bigger turbos or the bigger snails are fine. But anytime I add small snails to the tank, he just eats them. They're snacks. I've got probably 10 different snail shells in my bed in my little arch right now. Just because he keeps snacking on them. Uh, think, thinking of getting a fairy wrasse. I like the colors, but I'm hoping they take care of the pest before they be a problem. Um, I don't, I didn't have any pests when I've had fairy wrasse in the past, so I can't say for sure. They, um, in general, they were pretty good. Um, mine slept in the rocks, actually. My fairy wrasse, at least the one I had. I believe it was a McCocker's fairy wrasse, but it was a very pretty fish. What's going on, Kevin? Welcome, welcome. I go with a motto. I don't want anything in the tank. I didn't purposely put there. I QT everything, good and bad. Silver City Reef, you were one of the few. I give you props for that one. It is. It would be wise. I, I sometimes think it would be good to set up a quarantine tank. I haven't, but maybe one day. There you go. Get both the little guys on there. I uh, don't think Surahelia Russ, I'm probably butchering that name, are the best con pest control wrasses. Don't even know if they eat pests. I would say the best ones would be... Um, Small Melanaris, small yellow, cor small chorus wrasses. Just make sure the yellows don't get too crazy big. The red ones get really big, so avoid the reds. Six lines are all pretty good ones. Um, so, so fairies, flasher rashes are very well behaved and can be pretty colorful. I'm not into their swimming behavior, much of their color patterns, but the conspif conspific interactions are incredible to see. If you do have wrasses in like a harem, or you ha usually it's, you know, one male to multiple females. They do have some really cool kind of interactions. Has anyone tried the Mahana wand to take out Aptasia? I made my own Mahana wand in the past. So indirectly, yes. I had the Reef Dudes DIY special. And it definitely did kill them. 
I still feel, though, like it, I, it's questionable if it actually gets rid of them. It will 100% kill it. But I think in order to be successful, you'd want to turn off your flow and then suck out any remaining flush afterwards. Because I feel like they can come back. I don't know if it's something to do with babies or spores or the flesh regrows. So it's hard to say 100% what it is. But big ones definitely can kill them. But I still think it's beneficial to have, you know, some form of a pest eater to slowly munch away at it and get rid of the babies that come back. Uh, will Blue Throat Trigger eat peppermint? I have a Blue Throat Trigger and I had peppermint and i also have had will have two decently large fire shrimp and they've all been perfectly fine so blue throats are one of the most reef safe of all the trigger fish if you have a little tiny baby one i mean there's a good chance to turn to a snack and get sexy shrimp anything too small if it can fit in its mouth it'll likely become a snack um but yeah i'd say blue throats are your your safest uh, does leopard wrap eat Aptasia or nudibranch? Aptasia, no. Nudibranchs, possibly. I wouldn't be surprised if a, a, leopard, a leopard would eat baby nudibranchs. Most of them would. Uh, do fairy wrasses eat Nasaria, Ceres, or other cleaner shrimp? Uh, fairy wrasses. I would say snails, not my experience. I would say a, something like a sexy shrimp, quite possibly. Uh, cleaner shrimp and other ones are they're big enough. I'm sure they'd be fine. Uh, Greg, I've used the Mahana wand and laser. Fun, but it will just make it worse in the long run. Yeah, that's kind of what I felt with the Mahana wand. At least my DIY one. Uh, the laser, same thing. I find it questionable. Um, I was asking Mark about it actually earlier, and he said it worked really well for him. So he, I said, would you recommend it? He said, yep. So for him, it's there. I think it'd be fun to do it, but... Whether or not it's going to come back is the question. And I think that comes back to that thing where I think to be successful, you would want to turn off your flow. You want to suck out all that, you know, dead Aptasia that's left behind. I think that would be good. Uh, Tina, so your fairy rest loves bristle worms. He sits there waiting for me to siphon the sand so he can get his treats. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, how do I'm fine with inverts? What's going on, Rogue's Aquarium? Welcome, welcome. Got one in quarantine right now. Very nice. Uh, blue throw right now. Fingers crossed he's a good one. Yeah. I mean, every fish is different, right? So you always got to take that into account. But my blue throat has been perfect. The only one questionable thing that he might have, maybe, I had um, about a year ago, I had a starfish in there and somebody was nipping at his limbs. I don't know. And this was over Christmas where I was out doing family stuff. You know, I, I feed the tank pretty heavy and, you know, I was probably getting fed a little lighter that week. And somebody was nipping at the starfish. I don't know who it was. I can't say it's a trigger or not, but it's the only questionable thing that may or may not have been related to him. Otherwise, he's been perfect. I mean, that may have not even been him. Could have been a tang or someone else. Who knows? But in my experience, they've been awesome. Uh, yep, leprasses, they'll, they're definitely opportunistic. They'll hunt around whatever they find. Uh, Sarah snails are largely nocturnal, so I would suspect the small ones would live just fine with most grasses. Nostarius... Breathing tubes may be harassed, but not predatory specifically. Yeah, I'd agree with you on that one. Driving home, our day work, Kev. Uh, cleaners that aren't minuscule are probably quite safe. Nope. The general rule is, can it fit in its mouth? And if it can, it's probably at risk. So, you know, if you have a you know a bunch of small fish with tiny mouths, probably not an issue. But, you know, you have this full-grown big one with a nice big yap on it, there's a good chance it could go for a snack. Um, I used to have sexy shrimp in my big tank for a while, and I think I'm actually pretty sure it was the the bang guys that took out the one or two that I had in there, and they eventually moved to the nano what was left, but I lost one or two, and I'm fairly certain it was the bang guy cardinals, but they also have really big mouths. Um, speaking of which, completely off topic with the bang guys, I have two in there, and they've had eggs many times. I've seen the male hold them in his mouth, but I've never seen the babies. Now in nature, they release the eggs into a long spine urchin. So what I'm going to try and do, just for fun, to see if this makes any difference, is I gotta find some more. But I got um, this is gonna take a bunch of black tie straps, just plastic ones, no metal, and make like a little fake urchin, and just have that somewhere in the tank, and see if they release their eggs into it. So, so my to-do list to build one of these. I'm gonna take some putty and just make a makeshift urchin. That'd be pretty cool if I ended up with a bunch of babies. So you never know. <laughs> no, just worked, just got better. Always appreciated, Kevin. Thank you, sir. 
Um, yeah, if there's any other kind of past creatures you guys want to go over, let me know. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. I think I covered most of the, the goods for the main ones. Uh, I've used Coral Putty and Super Glue on Octasia. Oh, I've done that too. Even like GSP, I had one little crack of the rock. I'm like, bloop, putty over top, sealed in, so it doesn't take over. Uh, working here as well. Everyone's at work still. I guess it's pretty early. If you're on, if you're on the West Coast, it's only three something here. If you're on the East Coast, you're six something. It depends where you are, like, guys are in the world. Use Coral Putty, Super Glue. Yeah, with if you're using super glue on Aptasia, basically you want to do it inside the side of the thing. Uh, what about a box fish? Is it re-safe? In general, box fish or a cow fish type of thing can are are reef safe, and I don't th believe they will attack anything or go after anything specifically. However, some of them can re release a toxin or a poison if they get stressed out. And that's where the not so reef safe parts in. So if it's being harassed by a fish and it releases some toxin, it potentially could nuke your tank or cause some other issues. So the fish itself is fine. It's just if someone's being a predator or attacking it, then it's potentially a risk. But they are super cool fish. Um, some of them can grow really big, and that's why you don't see a lot of them. They're super cute when they're tiny, but they can grow up to you know a foot or more, and then that's an issue unless you have a massive tank. Um, I personally, so Matt was saying, don't believe that Mahano spread as easily. I, I'm still torn on that one, to be honest, right? Like some people I've heard mixed things, you know, even with Aptasia X, which is a very popular one. And some people say, yep, you know, it works well, awesome, kills it. And others say, okay, I used it and now I have more. And I've heard the same thing with the Mahano wand. So I've, I've heard that a bunch, a bunch of different Aptasia ways. So, right. So it's maybe the product works to kill it. You know, maybe it releases something that spreads and creates more. I don't know. I don't know. But I have heard, you know, both sides of the story on that one. So that one's still a little bit of a mystery. That's why I still think at the end of the day, even if you do attack it with your Joe's Juice, your Mahano wand or blazers, whatever it may be, it's still good to have some kind of a natural predator to take out any of the babies. Because usually your fish or shrimp or whatever you're you're using they'll go after the smaller ones but if it's too big then they probably won't touch it right so if you have your fish and you have some big mass one in the corner of your tank the odds are they're not going to eat it right but they'll eat the babies so that's why it's kind of sometimes you need to go for that double edge approach with it uh raven so i just keep a lot of carbon in the tank just in case oh there you go what do you do you have a uh, do you have one raven I'm curious you got the the cow fish or the box fish? Uh, Use super glue on Tasia in a few days and later I just removed the glue. Oh, that works. Perfect. I have not tried just super gluing it. There you go. Another, another good solution. Um, Kevin, how about copper band butterfly for dealing with Atasia? They are awesome Atasia eaters. You just need to make sure that you have one that eats another food source. Because I find some people... It, Sometimes, you know, the fish can send, start to starve if it doesn't have another food source because certain ones you might only eat it. Um, I can never say this. M Manila clams is one that food I found to be very successful for most of them. So if you have a fresh seafood market, you can get some of those and they'll, they have the nice little long nose. They'll pick at it and go for it from there. Uh, yellow coarse and melanaris rack work for me. Yep, definitely. I have both of those brasses and they both work very well. No to say. What's going on, 5280 Reefer? Welcome. So what are some other pests that you guys have had to deal with? Has there been any other kind of ones that have been a struggle or a bit of a pain to get rid of? I'm also kind of curious how many people actually quarantine all their stuff. I know a couple of you do, and I'm impressed. I dip everything, but quarantining is another level that one day I'll get there. I hate it when they only come out at night, but then I don't know if they damage slash eat anything. This is true. If you guys have never checked out your tank, it is invisible juice. It's ginger ale. Doo -doo -doo. The magical see-through can. Um, yeah, so a lot of some of these creatures only do come out at night. So if you haven't done it, it's really cool to look at your tank at night with a flashlight. Either a flashlight or if you get one of the UV ones. Oh, that's my clear one. I got a blue kind of UV one too. And it's really cool to go check at your tank at night and everything looks, you know, some corals look completely different. 
And yeah, you see all kinds of little creatures out that you don't see in the daytime. So it's kind of fun to do. Even some like the chalices to me look kind of crazy. Like it'll be all smooth skin. You look at it at night and there's these big little mouth eyes open up with big long tentacles come out sweeping around. And it is super duper interesting. Uh, how about Dino? Dino is a whole big stream. I actually have done a good one on that one with Cruise from Elegance Corals a while back. So that one's a good one to check out if you are dealing with Dino. Um, the quick and dirty overview is you essentially are introducing a bacteria to fight it. Um, Dr. Tim's has one, and I believe it's the waste away that has the bacteria that will eat it. You do that, you increase your aeration, so something like bubbling or take off your skimmer and carbon dosing to raise the army of bacteria to fight the dinos, and then after that you kind of tone it back down once you get in line. That, that's kind of the quick overview, but if you want the crazy detailed stream, we did a good 45 minute hour talk on how to beat dinos in the past. Um, Aptasia eating file fish, how reef safe are they? So Aptasia eating file fish are reef safe with caution. In general, like one of my buddies had one, he had it in his tank, didn't touch a single coral, not an issue. There's also certain ones that will go after LPS more like you know, might nip at the tentacles on them which would be similar to an Aptasia, so it's kind of understandable. But something like acans, I would question having with an Aptasia eating filefish, or a Dendrophilia, or any of those type of corals, or a Duncan, you know, is something that they may potentially nip at, especially because it looks similar, similar body structure, so that part is kind of questionable. Uh, I mean, the Mahana wand and Aptasia are two totally different anemones, true. Uh, Mahanos I physically remove before they never come back. Uh, it doesn't work with Aptasia. That's true. It actually just says in the name Mahano one. So Mahanos are like clear little anemones, little balls, or ball ball anemones another way. Um, they, I don't find those ones are, they don't, they can spread a lot, but they don't seem to be as stinging as aggressive as Aptasia's. Uh, Macaulay's Reef, I need a Harlequin shrimp for some of the small starfish, so... I uh, have had har harlequin shrimp in the past. Super cool shrimp. They're beautiful looking. They're white with like blue polka dots. There's some with have orangey brown spots on them. Now, the thing with them is they only eat starfish. They will eat nothing else. So you need to have a really big tank with a constant supply for them or basically have like, you know, the communal starfish that you'll lend to your buddy for a few months once you run out. And you can kind of rotate between you and a couple friends' tanks to clear them out every few months as needed. Uh, flatworm is a pain. I've used flatworm exit and a jade wrasse. Huh, nice. So flatworms. All right, that's another good one to touch on. So flatworms, the most common ones I see are the little orange rusty colored ones. Um, those guys aren't really a big issue. Like they're fairly harmless. There are certain ones that the biggest issue, if they get out of control, they're, they'll cover a coral and more block its light than anything else. Uh, wrasses or that little, I can't believe I forgot the name already, the other little damselfish we were talking about earlier, a lot of them will eat them. Um, so that's one easy way of controlling it. There is products like flatworm exit that will kill them. Uh, the thing to note with that is when they die, they can release a toxin to the water, which can cause trouble. So if you are trying to get, use something like flatworm exit, you wanna physically vacuum or suck out as much as you possibly can. Um, you'll wanna, once you do that, you'll turn off your UV, ozone, carbon, any that type of stuff. You'll dose the flatworm exit. Once you've removed as many as possible, then you dose it. And then as they die, like within a few minutes, like I believe I did a video on this a while back, and you'll start to see them kind of like float up as they die, and I'd suck them out right away. And after you're done your treatment, you want to run carbon right away to absorb any of those toxins they potentially released. Uh, Dr. Wilson Magic, I have Astrina stars, bristle worms, and Colonna Ista snails. No idea what those ones are. <laughs> then I started to quarantine everything in hindsight. I know. No one does quarantining until you've had a tank for a long time. You've dealt with stuff, and then it makes you want to do it. Uh, one you mentioned there, bristle worms are kind of an interesting one. Some people don't mind them, and some people hate them like the plague. In general, they're harmless cleanup crew. They do a great job. They're actually really good cleanup crew, but some people think they're creepy. Um, if you grab them or touch them with your hands, they have little tiny spines that can poke you. And most people, it's going to irritate them and annoy their skin. So it's kind of a double-edged one with that one. I'm not a huge fan of them. I had never really seen them. In my previous tanks, I definitely had some. But now I 
there's probably some in there, but I don't recall ever seeing any, so I've never really worried about it. Um, generally, if your tank is, you know, dirtier, or you feed really heavy, there's lots of stuff in the sand bed that's going to increase their populations. So as with most things, they'll expand based on how much food's available to them. Uh, Tristan, vermited snails. The only thing I've tried is bumblebee. I have seen tanks overrun with them. Uh, bumblebee snail is your best bet for natural predator. Otherwise, I mean, you can get in there and physically break their tubes or super glue their tubes. Those are your basic options to deal with vermited snails. Uh, what's going on, Rookie Reaper? Bumblebee snails, yep. Snails out the tubs. Bumblebee shrimp, we're good for stars plus they scavenge. Bumblebee shrimp. Never had a bumblebee shrimp. It's kind of interesting. Springer Damsel, thank you. I don't know why I keep forgetting that name. Uh, yeah, the, the only thing with harlequins, I'd feel bad. Like, I don't think I could go buy a big starfish and just feed it to them. I'd feel too bad for the starfish. But they, they are amazing for the Astro snails. Now, the one thing that I found was kind of cool is, well, interesting, is when I had a harlequin trip in the tank, all of a sudden, all the Astrina snails would start moving up to the top of the glass. So I could literally walk up to the tank in the morning and just, like, pull, like, ten of them off the glass. It's like, oh, there they all are. It's like they sense it that he's in the tank, and they know to, like, move away after. Uh, bumblebee snails eat vermin snails. Yes, yes, they do. I have a single bumblebee I've had in my tank for, like, four or five years. I've never seen a vermin snail. So I'm assuming he's doing his job. Uh, I've had a toadstool coral not open for three weeks. So if a toadstool is growing and it's shedding its skin, it will not open for a little while. So that's definitely one that I've seen happen. Otherwise, if it's something that's been like that for a while or something's changed or it's new, you can try putting it in a different location. If it's not happy but it's lighter flow, it might not open up. Uh, Matt, the biggest problem with red plant area flatworms, eventually if you don't do anything, the population will hit a tipping point. It's a massive die-off. So, yeah, there you go. If you don't do anything about it. Honestly, one of the things, if you guys like wrasses, add a wrasse to your tank. It's going to solve a lot of issues before anything ever comes up. Uh, 10 gallons enough for a quarantine. Depends what you're quarantining, but yes, in general, I would say it is. For, I mean... One day I'll get to that stage where I'll actually quarantine coral. But it's the problem is it's a, you need to have the space, right? It's a whole nother tank, whole nother system running. You know, if you have too much in it, you got to dose it. It's basically a whole nother setup. So, I mean, if you upgrade your tank, maybe you have like a little 5 or 10, 15 gallon tank, and maybe it's worth keeping it for that use. You know, long term, it's probably a wise idea if you're in this hobby for the long haul. Bobby, buying a bumblebee snail tomorrow. Excellent. What's going on, Buckles Reef? Uh, stroma snails breeding like crazy in my quarantine. Everyone says they're good, but the things breed like rabbits. Nice. Um, what would you avoid with clams? Uh, yes, copper bands and filefish have both been said to pick up the mantles of clams. So that is definitely a risk if you do have a clam in your tank. In that case, I would look at the Bergia snails possibly, or Bergia your ranks, sea slugs. Um, yeah, so it is something I consider, right? If you're doing one of these natural predators, you would have to consider what else is in your tank and make sure nothing else is going to be at risk by introducing something to go after something else. Uh, I don't feel bad for starfish. They don't have a central nervous system. I have no idea on that one. I would still feel bad, though. I don't feel bad for the Astrina stars, but I would for a big, cool one. Uh, does a banana wrasse and a cleaner wrasse eat pests? Cleaner wrasse definitely scours. Um, so the Blue Street cleaner wrasses, those guys have, I see them scouring hunting all the time. So those ones do. Banana wrasse, I've never had one, so I'm not sure on them. Uh, is it normal for the toadstool not to open up for three weeks? If it's not happy, it's likely it's not going up. i just try moving it somewhere else. Uh, I have a bare bottom tank. Can I still have a wrasse? All right, so J-L-U-S-P, Jilspo, however you say that. Um... If your tank's bare bottom, one solution is to get a little container of sand and put it, you know, in the back of your tank behind some rocks somewhere so that it still has a, a chunk of sand to sleep in. So that's your simplest solution for adding a wrasse that sleeps in the sand. Or you could look at wrasses that don't sleep in sand because some of them will sleep in rocks. So two different ways of looking at it. Uh, Frere 
Tuck, did I miss info on Monty eating nudies? Yes, yes, you did. But if you have a specific question on it, feel free to ask away and I can revisit it. Uh, I battled Zoa duties for a long time. And at one point, a trio of wrasses that couldn't keep up. That's a lot of them. Uh, having said that, wrasses are the best functional fish for nutrient control. 100% agree with you. Um, so the biggest thing, if you can see them in your tank um, generally they hide when the lights are on so if you come first thing in the morning get out of bed take a flashlight to your tank and if you see the adults physically suck them out like grab a little water change hose and suck out as many as you can see because um, sometimes the wrasses you know if they're too big you know and your wrasses is small maybe you won't go after it so by removing the adults then your the wrasses will generally do a good job of keeping up with all the babies uh, reef keeper, so you're saying your Melanaris tore the heck out of your clam. Ah, that's a nasty one. Yeah, definitely with clams and some LPS, you gotta watch out with certain fish that will go after the stuff. Uh, sapphire damsels are also good at eating flatworms. Huh, good to know. That's from Roke. Have a good night there, McCollum's Reef. Uh, fortunately, I don't have Aptasia anymore. Well... That's that's one one benefit of certain certain clean slate. Think of the clean potential. Uh, do do I want to buy a clam for my tank. Don't know if they are hardy. Okay, if you're gonna buy a clam, buying a bigger clam is hardier. If you buy a baby clam, they're very heavy on filter feeding. So, a baby clam like an inch or two inch type of thing. I would want to be culturing or dosing lots of phyto content to your tank because they're very heavy on that filter feeding when they're small. As they get bigger, um, they go more on to the photosynthetic end of the spectrum. So then that as their mantle grows, they can get a lot more of their energy out of light. I mean, so clams definitely still appreciate phyto, but they I would say it's a requirement for a tiny clam. You know, like less than three inches, you know, especially the smaller it is, the more it needs it, but the bigger it is, the more photosynthetic it is. So... That's the biggest kind of tip I'd say with clams. Uh, do wrasses eat Monty eating nudies? What's the best way to control? Okay. Um, for me personally, my experience, six line wrasse, Melanaris wrasse, or yellow chorus wrasse all do well for Monty eating nudies. Physically remove what you can. Um, for me, water change hose, sucking them out is the easiest way to get rid of them. Then you can kind of just rub it against the edge of your Monty and suck them out physically, break their little grip on it and then use the wrasses to pick off any of the babies that hatch until you eventually break that life cycle. Uh, we have to talk more about clams. We will do We will do a live stream on that. I'll see if I can get Kevin Gaines or someone on that used to, I don't know if he still does, but he was working for Biotos and Culturing Clams. I think it'd be a really interesting one to get on. I'll see what I can do for a future clam stream. See if I can get an expert on to talk about it. Um... Yeah, so fairy wrasses sleep in a mucus cocoon. That that actually, when I first got into reefing, that was an interesting one because I'd feel this like little log in the sand. I was like, "What the heck is that?" And I eventually learned that's the cocoon that the wrasse makes for itself. So certain wrasses will go in the sand and they'll excrete kind of a mucus. It'll form like a little cocoon kind of sleeping bag for them. And it, it was always weird just to see these little like cocoons in the sand, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, nitrate zero, phosphorus from a point two. That's some ultra low nutrients you got there, Owen. What's going on, Acrobreeder? Gabe, just want to say thank you for your doing this stream. Helps a lot. Thanks very much, Gabe. Thanks for the special request. Uh, much, much appreciate, buddy. And thank you for being on Patreon, too. Double thanks, Gabe. You are awesome. And I appreciate it. Uh, I have a tank which is rocking it, curing, and I have some Astrina starfish in there. I just pluck them out and drop them in my frag tank with a harlequin. As hey, that's a good way to do it. He's like little snacks for the little guy. Uh, tank's about eight months old. What was the previous one to that one? Yeah, no, it's doing pretty good. Your nutrient export is keeping up where you're keeping your feeding low, one of the two, but it's a good place to be, Owen. Uh, uh, species specific for substrate. Generally, most clams just take about any light you give them as long as they can acclimate it. Mild mantle movement with flow is good. Yeah, so the big thing, if you are buying a clam, 
two things. Make sure that there's no injuries or cuts to the foot. If there is, that's a big one. Um, with the mantle, it should be responsive to light. So if you have a climb in there, if you put your hand over it and shadow it for a second, you should see the mantle quickly retract or move and sense that, that light change. If it's not very responsive, usually that could be an indication that something's up with the clam and it might not be as healthy and as you know perfect as you'd want. Clams are generally not the cheapest in the world. You know, they're kind of more expensive. So we want to make sure you start with a very good, healthy specimen. You know, a little bit bigger is going to make your life easier as well. So stuff to keep in mind if you're going the clam route. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, which ones? Bobby, Bobby, would you say previously? And they're less aggressive wrasses in the six, six and four line rash family that do an awesome job. Okay, so... I have not personally had a six line wrasse, but it seems some people love them and some people just complain about them and say they're buggers. Like I have lots of friends that have a six line. I, I went with Melanaris and Yellow Chorus and Leopard Wrasse and other ones. So, um, do fish eat clam? Reef safe. Um, certain fish like a butterfly or some file fish may nip at a clam's mantle. So it depends. Um, Hippopus clams are easier. Yeah, I've only tried a Maxima clam, and the one that I had, I eventually something ate, I think something attacked or ate the foot from the bottom. This was a few tanks back, and I don't know if it could have been like a bristle worms or some kind of creatures, but something went after the foot from the bottom. I have seen little products out on the market that are like little dishes or little rocks with a bit of a bowl for the clam to put its foot in. Um, so that may be an option. If you could have something where you can raise it off of the sand bed, if you did have any of those creatures in there, something else to kind of consider. Or you could put on your rocks a bit higher. Clams do love lots of light, though, so usually you can put them almost anywhere in the tank. Ideas on why curls are not growing well. 12 gallon, mostly softies, zoas, shrooms, tillstool, kenya tree, one small frog spawn, 20% water change weekly. Um, so, Owen, on your case, it kind of depends on how old the tank is. Generally, a weekly water change, you know, 12 gallon, that's nice and easy. And that should, most of your stuff are softies. You don't really have any encrusting corals, uh, small frog spawn. I mean, that will take a bit of calcium milk up. It won't be huge. Your water, I'm going to say a water change are probably fine for your tank, given it's mostly softies. Now, the biggest thing is just stability in the tank. Um, I also find it takes a little while. If your tank's still new, your corals are new. It takes a little while for those corals to kind of settle in. Like I've had some where I'll add a coral to the tank and it'll do nothing for a month or two. Then all of a sudden one day it'll just take off and grow. So it could be your corals came from a different parameters, different system, and there just takes a while for them to settle in and kind of reestablish themselves and be happy again. So that's one definitely big kind of potential with that. So it could just be a time game. At the end of the day, I find the biggest thing, you know, with any tank is keeping, you know, your temperature, your parameters fairly stable, and then that's going to keep things happy. But yeah, with yours, mostly softer corals, they're generally pretty hardy. So once they settle in, you should be doing all right. Uh, the lion wrasses don't need a sand bed. Yeah, I don't know if it's six lions if they sleep in the rock. Uh, tank's about eight months old. Yeah, so I mean, that's part of it. The other part's how old your corals, but just the stability thing. The longer the tank's up, you know, corals will settle in the longer you have them and start to take off. So I'd just say, keep it stable, keep it happy, and you're good. Uh, they grew at first, but now it's slowing down. So it could be, too, like, if you test all the parameters in your tank, you know, if it could be a nutrient issue, maybe there's too much, not enough, or one of your parameters, maybe if you test what your your alkalinity and all your different parameters in the tanks are. Like, does it swing from week to week if you're not dosing, only doing water changes? So a couple of things that you could test to see what it is. But biggest thing for... It's just keeping your tank stable. Uh, nope, they sleep in the rock. Okay, there you go. So six lines sounds like it's a good option for bare bottom tanks. A couple of other fish. Take the tank over there alone. All right, so six link. So it sounds like the six line, just from the, the love that most people have them, is it can just be a bit territorial. Uh, what are your thoughts on quarantining shrimps and snails? I have not. In theory, I'm going to say it's always a good idea to quarantine stuff. However, shrimps and snails are fairly low risk. I mean, there is like a possibility that something could come in and attach to its shell, but it's not very likely. Like it's 
pretty unlikely to have like a coral pest or some other pest on your inverts. So yeah, one of the ones I personally have never worried about it. If you have an extra tank, I mean, put them in there for a month and if they're all good, move them all over. But overall, it's not something I've personally worried about. Um, so yeah, one tip that you're saying is some of the more territorial aggressive fish, like potentially a six lime, is just add that fish last. So it's not already has some territory of the whole tank that's trying to defend. Um, are peppermint shrimp good for Aptasia? Yes, they are. They're probably one of the more common Aptasia removal hunters that are fairly easy to get. Just make sure it's a real peppermint shrimp and not a false peppermint shrimp, aka camel shrimp. Uh, thanks for testing. Thanks, we'll start testing more and see if there are swings I'm not aware of. Yeah, it's one of those things. Like, I just try and test before even like test before your water change then test after it and to see how much of a change it has or to see how much it changes in a week so something to consider uh what's the hardest to deal with pests you've ever come across hmm good question like the monte poor eating nudibranchs were only my nano so they weren't too bad um i'm gonna say i got rid of the adults over four or five days and then the Yellow chorus wrasse got rid of the babies, and I left him there for about a month before I moved him to the big tank. And so he did a pretty good job of dealing with it. So that wasn't too bad. Um, I did have some corals once with red bugs, but I did put them in my tank. I literally had them in a little container in their own little system just to try and see if I could deal with them that way. And then some of the corals bit the dust because it wasn't the best little tiny tank. Uh, probably temperature issues more than anything. But I wouldn't say there's any that have been crazy bad, so... So far, probably the Zoar Montes, but they weren't that hard to get rid of. Um, Daticus, I quarantine every coral invert, anything that's wet and alive in a fish fallow setup. You're a good man. That is a good way to go. What's going on, Click Clacks? Uh, from Tijuana, Mexico. Very nice. Welcome there, Krolos. K R L O S, Cross. Mr. Johan. Uh, do, do, do. Pyramids can decimate clams. Okay. So if you get a new clam, this is a, this is a good point. If you get a brand new clam, that you look for little tiny snails that might possibly be on them. If you do get a clam and you see these little tiny pyramid snails on the shell, take the clam out and scrub it with like a toothbrush. Um, same thing. Always inspect new clams. Like anything else, just, you know, they're hardy enough. Take them out and just scrub off their shell and get those little creatures off the shell. And if you see your clam is not fully open up, its mantle's not fully open, that's another sign there could be a pyramid snail or something on there attacking it or annoying it. So same thing. Pull it out of the tank. Give it a good scrub. And that definitely goes a long way. Very low nutrients have also slowed down coral growth in the past. Um, yep. Definitely 100% agree with you on that one, Sir Cam. If you have... If you have... So, nut corals need nitrates and phosphates. If you have an ultra-low nutrient system, you could possibly be starving corals for some of those nutrients that they need. So, if your system's too efficient, your filtration's too good, or you're feeding too light, that could potentially inhibit coral growth. Now, on the opposite side of the spectrum, too high of nutrients could possibly inhibit coral growth more in Acropora and in crushing corals, probably not as much in softies, but it still definitely could come into play. So something else to consider. Um, I think I covered most of it. I do have company coming over soon, so I think I'm going to call it for now. But thank you guys for hanging out. If you guys do have any questions after the fact, you can always let me know in the comments below. If you guys are new, make sure you hit that subscribe button and that bell. Um, if you do enjoy it, make sure you smash that thumbs up button. Uh, can Dan clams be dipped in bears? That is a good question. I have never personally dipped a clam. So that's, that's a good questionable one. I, I've always didn't want to risk it or put the stress on the clam. I would more inspect it, check the shell, but you might have to research that one a little bit more. Uh, ultra low nutrients can work. They have access to nitrates from other dissolved, most commonly being various foods. A sharp edge to balance on. It is good to have nutrients. My tank has been super low nutrient lately, so I've just been feeding heavier. Personally, I think it's a better way to go because then you're giving the corals more food, which will help them grow more. So, 
what would be good to eat flatworms in a nano? Uh, flatworms in a nano, I would do a small yellow chorus rasp or a springer danzel. Those would be my two guesses. All right, guys, I appreciate everyone hanging out tonight. Don't forget to hit that smash that thumbs up button. If you're not, if you're new, hit that subscribe button. And I will see you guys in the next video.